Would I have ever allowed my kids to go down the path that I was put down? And I go, not in a million years. Aaron Smith Levin was a Scientology member for 29 years. We discussed what it was like growing up inside Scientology, how he lost nearly everything when he left, and the psychology behind our deepest beliefs. So like literally our own nanny, who we're paying, she's ratting us out to the Scientology authority. Oh my gosh. Aaron, thank you so much for being here, man. Very excited to chat with you. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so I wanted to ask, what made you decide to join Scientology at four years old? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I was looking for a change in my life. <laughs> yeah, so you got into it at four years old. I was, I'm actually curious. It was your mother that, that got into Scientology. Is that right? What, what attracted her to it at that point? I mean, speaking for her, I guess, I, I've asked her a little bit about this over the years, but um, I guess she would say she always felt like she was looking for something that felt like the answer. Um, I guess she always felt like she was seeking something, seeking some fundamental truth, um, something that just answered all the unanswered questions. I think that's probably a fair way to describe it. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the fundamental part of Scientology where it kind of says all of the answers for everything lie inside of you, so, sort of, that, that you are the answer to everything and that you can um, find the answer to anything, that, that you are sort of essentially the most powerful unit of energy that there is. Um, and there's sort of a, maybe a, self, a self-affirming nature of the Scientology belief that can appeal to a certain personality type, particularly at the lower levels, that, you know, you are the answer. You are ne Neo. You are the answer. <laughs> well, that's there is something I don't, like that is not unique to Scientology, obviously, and that that there's a lot of spiritual traditions that say you know God is inside of you, and you know even though it might appear to be this divine outside force, it actually occurs within you. Is there in Scientology? It seems like the things that attract people, and the things that I eventually see in the uh, going clear and the aftermath foundation style stuff, that there is a disruption at some point where it goes from really helpful self-help auditing tell me about your past recognize your own power to something else is that is is that an accurate description is it true that most people at the you know beginning echelons of scientology are, are getting their money's worth so to speak well they would have to at least feel like they're getting their money money's worth or they would never try the next step there might be an aspect i, I think it's a kind of a two-pronged thing where some of them are like oh wow this is great what's next some of them are like, ooh, it wasn't quite what I was hoping for. But then the salesman is like, oh, but the answer's on the next thing. You got to do mm -hmm. the next thing. It's a little bit of both. I mean, if no one ever felt they ever got any of their money's worth at the, at the earlier lower levels, honestly, I mean, would anybody really continue? Probably not. Mm -hmm. So, but it's very just self-helpy. It's not, it's not very spiritual. It's not very churchy. It's not religious -y, relig religious e or religious-ish, whatever. It, 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 there is sort of an appeal to people who want to believe in something more or greater, but don't want a whole lot of religion. That's mm -hmm. kind of what Scientology feels like at the introductory levels. Got it. Okay. So let's go back to your story. At the beginning, you're, you're getting into Scientology. At some point, uh, you and your family get very involved in it to the point where you like, don't go to traditional school. What was that transition for you? So I went to like normal public school until the sixth grade. For some reason, in the seventh grade, my mom decided all the kids needed to be homeschooled for the seventh grade. So we were in the middle of that homeschool year when our parents all decided we were going to join staff. So we would do homeschool in the morning and early afternoon, and then we would all load up the car, drive from South Jersey into downtown Philly, and we would do our, um, our staff training there from like 6 o'clock at night to 10 o'clock at night. Like course would go until 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Then you'd wrap up, load up, go back home. So that was, I remember that was like, that was a transition period. For me, that was the transition period of going from just being a normal kid who did sort of school stuff during the day and kid stuff the rest of the time to someone who did something resembling school during the day and then started very quickly getting accustomed to working for Scientology every, every night. Wow. Yeah. What, um, what does working for Scientology entail as, as a kid? For us at that time, instead of being forced to do some normal, um, what you might call something more akin to an office job, we pretty much just went on full-time study. 
So there, there's a certain percent, there's a certain group of Scientology staff members whose job is to just study full time training how to be a Scientology auditor. And that's what we were all joining staff to be. It was this whole recruitment drive following, you know, in 1993, the big thing that happened in Scientology was the IRS gave them their tax exempt status back. Uh, so Scientology got their tax exempt status for the second time. And to celebrate that event, they were on this huge recruitment drive to have like 20 Scientology auditors in training for every Scientology organization. That was the, that was the, the impetus for my mom to be like, this is the time, you know, this is a sign. We can all join staff right now and instantly go into full-time auditor training. Whereas normally you have to work on a normal Scientology post. That's more like any other business you'd, you'd be mm -hmm. in, whether it's, um, you know, uh, reception or sales or accounting or, you know, promotion and marketing, whatever, like working in a Scientology organization is very similar to working in any normal business. Yeah. That that's what I'm hearing is that unlike some of the jobs that you might have at church, which are, you know, often volunteer. And then there's like a full-time priest class of staff that runs it. It sounds like the line between Scientology person. And then once you join staff is you're, you're kind of in a corporate environment. Correct. You're in a corporate environment. You're answerable to them. You're on a contract. Um, you're technically doing your Scientology courses and auditing for free. But if you don't finish your contract, then you have to pay them back for, for all of that stuff. So, but your original question was, well, what does that mean for you to be working at a Scientology org as a kid? What does that mean? Full-time study is what it mm. means. Full-time study. And how do you feel about it at this point in your life? So you're, you've now been taken out of school. You've had the first couple years of a quote unquote, semi-traditional American life. And now you're doing something radically different. What, what was the emotional experience of that like? So a large part of it was, oh God, I don't really want to be doing this, but it's what we're expected to do. And, and that's life. That was the large part of it, especially just from the mentality of a child who would mm -hmm. rather be doing anything other than, you know, working in an organization. There was another part of it though, where, um, you know, young children in Scientology who are expressing an interest in, in doing it and actually doing the courses and doing the auditing, they are very much somewhat put on a pedestal. Um, it, you are not treated like a kid. Uh, Scientology doesn't even really hold that there is such thing as a kid other than a, 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 a thetan that's trillions of years old happens to be in their new body and the body hasn't grown up yet. There's no idea that there's a child mind or a developing brain, I should say. There, there's no idea that uh, a human being goes through stages of development and um, it's just, you just happen to have a, a child body, but you're mm -hmm. expected to behave as an adult. And for a child who, you know, if you think like children do want to be granted more freedom and respect and whatever. And the truth is in the Scientology environment, being a staff member, being a SEERG member as a young person, you are actually given quite a bit of that. Um, there's even this idea that for you to have uh, shown such a strong interest in Scientology at such a young age, you were a Scientologist in the last lifetime and probably a high level Scientologist. And, and, and so you were aware enough to make sure that you were uh, picked up a new body that was part of a Scientology family or that, wow. you, knew would, or that you knew would get into Scientology. So you're like Dalai Lama. You you were you 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 were born into this as as a wise master. It's young children in Scientology are very much looked upon that way. <laughs> Interesting. So past lifetimes, Scientology isn't that old. Does that mean past lifetimes on Earth or past lifetimes in the universe? On Earth, because Scientologists okay. believe that Scientology is truly unique to this um, this time. It's the one. It's the only thing you've never done before is Scientology. Mm -hmm. And so, but Scientology got kickstarted, you know, Dianetics was in 1950, Scientology really started in 1954. Uh, but basically any young Scientologist, Scientologists believe are past life Scientologists. That's fascinating. And, and that's got to be so appealing. I can think of myself at that age where what I, I, I believed, I was like, I have the full capacities of an adult, that I'm just not recognized in the responsibility that I ought to be given to be making decisions that I clearly know how to do. And I look back on that, and if that were overindulged, that could have created a tremendous amount of harm. And even as I've looked back at things that I regret or things that happened to me, and considering myself an adult was a bit harmful to me at that point in my life because it didn't allow me to acknowledge the lack of agency that I honestly had at that point. And then it confused me you know, a lot. And I'm curious if that resonates for you with your experience. It resonates with me mostly because of 
because of the fact that I have kids of my own. Mm. Uh, I think it, it can be hard for me to um, try to recall my mindset from those really formative, you know, 12 to 16 years old. When I look back on those years, I tend to go, yes, I was well served during those years, development wise, emotionally, um, what uh, uh, self confidence wise. I can, I can look over everything I went through and go, I managed to take a lot of the best of what I could from that and kind of managed to avoid a lot of the worst of what could have happened and all that. But then I have kids of my own. And now my kids are 16, 14, and 12. And I go, would I ever, would I have ever in a million years allowed my kids to go down the path that I was put down just because I felt like maybe I took away some good stuff from it? And I go, not in a million years. Yeah. And, and that was sort of reflected for me and my wife when, you know, w- w- we already had all three of our children before we were officially out of Scientology. And there was this sort of unspoken thing bet- between us where we never introduced Scientology to our kids ever. Even when we were still technically true, you know, true believer Scientologists, it never even occurred to us that we would want our kids exposed to um, the kind of things we'd been exposed to. It was sort of this thing like, yeah, it was okay for me, but mm-mm, yeah. mm, not for our kids. But it was, I said it was an unspoken thing. We never sat mm-hmm. down and said, hey, look, we're not, we're, we're not doing with our kids what was done with us. We've, we never even had that conversation. It yeah. was just sort of this gut reaction or this, you know, at, 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 our, at our DNA level of like, mm-mm, nope. Wow. <laughs> Have you seen the documentary? It was the Michael Jackson documentary, Finding Neverland on HBO. Yes. I am so reminded of the moment where one of the guys who was, you know, sleeping over Michael Jackson's house and had gone and testified and said nothing happened and there was no problem. This was a wonderful thing in my life. Has a kid of his own and she's at that age and he tells a story of just like seeing her exist (laughs) in the street and somebody saying something about the age. That was your age. And he just broke down and cried. And I think it's a very natural thing to, yeah. of course, review your own story. Be like, look, I got to get the best out of this. <laughs> I have to, I have to find a way to have taken everything. Cause this is, this is fixed. And then you get older and you see actually have agency to protect someone else at that age. You go, Holy crap. The innocence is just so, yeah, I, it's, it's instructive. I don't know. I'm, I'm just struck by that. I remember that part of Neverland and that really, that really impacted me um, very strongly emotionally because um, I think there was, has just been so much of, uh, you know, the second generation experience in Scientology, being born and raised in it, is just a completely different experience than people who joined Scientology as an adult and, mm-hmm. and, and they raised their kids in it. And, and the first gen members tend to just think that their experience must be what the kids' experience was. And it was fine. It's what you wanted to do. And there was nothing wrong with it. And you're like, yeah, but there was a lot wrong with it even stuff we didn't realize was wrong at the time like even just the nature of a scientology auditing session as a child engaging in an auditing session there's a power dynamic there that is very um i don't know it creates almost a ptsd like situation later on where when you go into an auditing session as the person receiving the auditing you are indoctrinated you are taught you know you're not allowed to leave that room it's not, you're not allowed to end an auditing session. You're not allowed to get up. You're not allowed to say, I don't want to answer this question. You're not allowed to say, I don't want to talk about that. You, it, it, leaving an auditing session will get you expelled from Scientology. <laughs> which, is the, which is the end of your life if you're a child. That's it. That's right. Now, it's different you're, if you're an, an adult who just paid $200 an hour for this auditing session and you're, you want to participate in it. You're a willing participant. It's different if you're a child and you're being forced to do it. You didn't ask for it. You didn't pay for it. You you didn't consent to it. You're not even old enough to consent to it. And you know, you're you're in this auditing room with a stranger who's allowed to talk to you and ask you about literally anything. There's no special rules in an auditing session for children, nothing like this. It's a very inherently abusive situation. And um, well, to to give a lot of these Scientology parents who are first-gen members the benefit of the doubt, they may not even truly understand what that feels like to be in that situation. As a child, even as a young, dedicated staff member and, and, and later member of the C organization, I detested getting auditing. Never at any point in my Scientology career, despite being a true believer, did I ever want 
or desire or willingly participate in auditing. It was always something I had to do. I knew I had to do it. I knew I couldn't get around it. I knew the consequences for refusing auditing. And, um, and it's weird because, you know, when I say that out loud, someone's going to go like, it sounds like you, you were, you didn't really believe. And you go, no, that's where the story gets crazy. I mean, I actually <laughs> believed and I still had this cognitive dissonance of, I believe in the story. I believe in the prison planet shit. I believe in the full OT stuff. I believe in the upper OT levels, but man, I hate getting auditing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, Catholic school is not dissimilar from that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I don't want to do this crap, but I very dissimilar in the intensity severity. And one of the things you were talking, I think it's remarkable that you held on to this feeling of hating that the auditing. I think it's very easy for people in those situations where there is no escape to just go, I love this. This, <laughs> this is, you know, to find a way because that's, it's, it's like the most natural coping mechanism. One of the ways it seems that that is reinforced is that auditing, I believe you mentioned, always has to end on a positive note. Is that correct? That's correct. You're not allowed to end an auditing session on a bad, at a bad point. And so as someone receiving an auditing process, especially if you're trained on how to be an auditor, you know damn well, well, it's time for me to end this thing. I, I got to get myself to a good point. You have mm -hmm. to almost convince yourself you, you've gotten to a good point. You got to like, yeah. you're, you're, you're your own best hype man. You got to- So you can get out of there. So you can get out of there. Oh my God. It's like having to say thank you to the person who has just hurt you in order to end the situation, which is such a mind- twister. Um, but I want to, I think people have a broad idea probably if they're watching this, but let's just touch briefly on what auditing is in case somebody's going, I'm not totally sure about this. It's Scientology's version of one-on-one -on -one counseling. Um, uh, you can't really compare it to psychotherapy or um, professional counseling because well, the only way you can compare it is in structure. It's a one-on-one -on -one talk therapy situation. And uh, that's where the similarity ends, really. And Scientology auditing sessions employ this machine called an e-meter or an electropsychometer. And that meter is supposed to be what tells the auditor whether the auditing session is at a good point um, that qualifies to end the session. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the meter, if someone wants to Google or whatever, you know, it just looks like an easy bake oven with a, it's got some dials on it. And one of the main dials is, is a needle. And essentially, the emitter just registers um, the change in the resistance to your body to an in your body to an a small electrical flow. But the needle goes back and forth, and most of what it means to train a Scientology auditor is training them how to use this emitter, how to interpret the needle, the needle's reads on the emitter, and how to use the meter to guide an auditing session. So, as someone experienced in getting auditing, you essentially get to the point where you know how to make your needle. Uh, they call it float, which is to very smoothly go back and forth like it's not mm -hmm. connected to anything. And you know what you have to do to make your needle float so that the auditor can say, thank you very much, your needle is floating, we're gonna end the session. What um, do you have to do internally? So that, that's what's interesting is that it, it yeah. does seem to correspond to some internal processes. Yes, most people will tell you that they'll just think really happy thoughts, they'll, have, they'll go to their happy place, some, some moment of, ex of peace or serenity or exhilaration, you know, that time they won that race in high school or something. Um, me personally, you do have to sort of put yourself in a happy, a happy headspace, but me personally, if I could breathe very, very softly through my nose and let it out through my mouth, um, that would, uh, and, and do that, uh, space it out. Like, um, taking in a deep breath through your nose and letting that through your mouth makes the needle fall hard to the right. Uh, um, but if you do it very softly and, and certain people's bodies react differently, like some people that needle just slams over to the right. Some people, it barely moves. I eventually, um, uh, for myself got to know how that needle would react to various breathing through my nose. And that is, that is how I would make my needle flow. <laughs> oh my goodness. Talk about spiritual bypass. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, Oh, are we on a good note? Yes. I've controlled my breathing just precisely enough to get you to stop. Wow. Yes. That's incredible. So Any, anyone who's had hundreds of hours of auditing knows how to make their needle float. <laughs> goodness and and in this process there is there does seem to be another similarity with psychotherapy which is the earlier similar which is they'll ask you about something in your life and then direct you well has something like that happened before has something that happened before and that's that's part of the process that i imagine for some people and a similar not not similar but that sort of psychotherapeutic parts therapy approach i have found valuable when not done under duress you know trying to make a needle flow 
that's the thing. It all comes down to whether you're a willing and cooperative participant in this thing. And, mm-hmm. and I think for those who've had a lot of success with Scientology auditing or will tell you they've gotten a lot out of it, I think that's what it comes down to. They were just genuinely a really willing, happy, and cooperative participant. And just about anything can make you feel good, especially if you're paying hundreds of dollars for the privilege. You, you, you want to make it feel good. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just never a particularly – willing and cooperative participant. I think there's a general, um, probably therapeutic structure, um, therapeutic nature to the overall structure of an auditing session, not because it's unique to an auditing session, but because it has so much in common with other therapeutic things. Like just being able to have a two-way conversation with someone and talk about something that's bothering you is going to be therapeutic, whether you're doing it with a buddy at a bar or whether you're paying $200 an hour for a Scientology auditing session. So- I think there's a structure to an auditing session, particularly if you're a willing participant, that might lend itself to causing you to feel decent at the end of a session. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I I don't think it's unique to the, what they would call the technology of Scientology. I think it's just the nature of, of talking about stuff. If, if almost any other thing said, Hey, you're going to have to sit down with someone and talk about your week and tell them how you felt. <laughs> Not have to, you are invited to, that would right. probably be good for a lot of people, whether it's a friend or, you know, a therapist or something else. So I, I see, I see the value there. What makes Scientology auditing, um, unique amongst, um, any therapies that employ this earlier, similar structure is that Scientologists believe we've been around for like 76 trillion years. And so if you're doing your auditing session and you're talking about some upset that you have right now and your needle doesn't float, they're going to ask you for an earlier, similar time, you, uh, an earlier time you had a similar upset. And if you've gone as early as you can think of in this lifetime and your needle still isn't floating, they're going to ask you for an earlier, similar time. And Scientologists who are really experienced in auditing, they'll, just, they'll, be, they'll be going millions, billions of years down uh, what they call the time track trillions of years, other, ga- other solar systems, other galaxies, other universes, other realities. So there's also a completely fictionalized, imaginative aspect of this Scientology auditing where you're literally just making shit up. Mm. You, and, and the truth is the more auditing you get, the more of your auditing is comprised of things like that. Yeah. Having to recalling past lives. And it becomes your memories of your past lives become really wrapped up in um, your identity, who you think you are, even as a person, as a, as a being over the eons. It's not, it's not who you are. Isn't what you've done this lifetime. It's what you've been doing for the last trillions of years. And Scientology auditing is really wrapped up in a lot of that. Wow. And I'm, and these people I'm, I'm almost certain are very sincere in, in these beliefs. Yeah. Uh, did you ever have that experience at all? Or did all of your audits get back to, you know, you were born and they were all this <laughs> lifetime <laughs> because it made me so uncomfortable. I actively resisted any, um, mm. encouragement from the auditor to do that. Cause auditors really do want you to go whole track, whole track is what they call your past lives. Mm-hmm. Um, the earliest I ever was, uh, allowed myself to have my arm twisted to remember was just the most recent previous lifetime of getting Dianetics auditing in Washington. DC and I was just totally making it all up. So, but you were a previous Scientologist. We've we figured it well, out. You're expected to be. I mean, yeah. it is imposed upon you that this is what you are, and you yeah. know it's what everyone wants to hear as well. Yeah. Wow. And I imagine for some people, it can be a way to work out unconscious thing. You know, it wasn't me. It was um, someone else that carries a tremendous amount of guilt about something that they did that lived 76 trillion years ago. Yeah. Except, except it's you, you're, you're admitting it's you, like yeah. you don't change over the time. You are the same uh, being today. You were then it's just easier to admit to some shit that you're making up in your mind. And where there's that separation of this lifetime and the other lifetime. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So this period you are you still happy? Like now you're working as a Scientologist. Do you enjoy the work? Are you happy to be doing what you're doing during this period of time? When I do just generally recall that time period from let's say roughly 12 or 13 to roughly 17 years old, I do think back about those times mostly fondly. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I can imagine one, the mission, but also, you know, it's life. It's, it's yeah. your one life. It's like, this is, this yeah. is, it's, it's got to make and it I, good. And I was succeeding on the path that I was yeah. on and expected to, 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 to be traveling. I was excelling mm-hmm. and succeeding at it. So that made my experience more positive 
than, you know, because uh, because remember, as a minor, as a minor child during all of this, it's not you don't have any inherent protections. So the fact is, if I was struggling, if I was getting in trouble, my experience would have been much different and there wouldn't have been anyone there to protect me. You know, there would have been no protections in place for the fact that I was just a minor child being exposed to all this. Yeah. The fact that I happened to succeed and excel at what I was supposed to be doing sort of allowed me to bypass, um, almost, almost just fortunately bypass some of the worst ways that could have gone for me at that time. Yeah. So moving forward, at some point, your brother gets disillusioned or gets kicked out. What is the story of, of how you guys wound up feeling very differently for a period of time about Scientology? So this is when, you know, I said, we all sort of joined staff in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, shortly after that, we all came down to Clearwater, Florida, where I now live. Uh, there's a large Scientology organization here called the Flag Land Base or the Flag Service Org, or just called Flag. And Flag is where staff members from all over the world um, who are training to be like the top auditors and some other stuff at their orgs. They're supposed to come here to Flag to train, even if they're not staff members here at Flag. So we did that for a few years. Um, my brother at that time, Colin, very much excelled and was sort of one of, one of the rock stars at that time. And then he just sort of got himself into trouble. So we were in Florida. My father lived in Minnesota at this time. My 14-year-old brother, who'd never even been raised by my father, called my father and said, I don't want to be here anymore. And my father bought him a plane ticket. My brother called a cab. Went, this is in Tampa. Went to the, to the Tampa airport by himself as a 14-year-old. Went to wow. the airport and flew to Minnesota um, to to go with my dad, just because he was afraid of how much trouble he was going to get into just for having done something like gone to the movies, gone to the mall. You know, he, I think he had one of these, you know, a, a titty bag or whatever. Um, and so, uh, uh, the, but this was a pivotal moment though, because my brother blowing from flag like that, that's, it's almost un, an unimaginable violation. Yeah. So he came back, my mom got on a plane, went and got him, brought him back, and he was sort of in this um, making amends period, trying to get back into everyone's good graces. And then he did actually succeed in getting back into everyone's good graces. He was put back onto his auditor training. And then David Miscavige, the leader of Scientology, uh, just decided, just one night, he said, hey, we've got all these trainees at Flag right now. There's some of them who have blown in the past and been recovered and are still in the program. Anyone on this program who's ever blown before, you're not qualified to be here anymore. Wow. You, you got to go home. And that was my brother. But my mom and I were still in Clearwater training. And now he had to go home. And so this was a big problem. And so essentially, my mom accompanied him back to Philadelphia just for a week or two so he could get set up living with one of her friends in South Jersey. And he was expected to go back to Philly by himself as a minor child without his parents or his brother and to essentially work for Scientology there, sort of unaccompanied minor. Um, and that was not a good experience for him. He ended up blowing again when he was up there, just stopped showing up for work at the org. When I eventually finished my training and went back, you know, as like a celebrated hero, practically, um, one of the first things I did was just to bring him back into the org so that we were both doing the same thing and whatever. Then we actually both got disillusioned when we were 17 years old and we said, we're bouncing this joint. And we got on a bus and we moved to LA. And for two years, we actually had nothing to do with Scientology. Oh, uh, really? We still considered ourselves Scientologists, but okay. we, but, but remember I said, we had broken our staff contracts. So we owed Scientology like a hundred thousand dollars each. <laughs> Wait a second. So We're tell me about 17. these contracts. Pause, pause here. <laughs> what do these contracts say? And when do you sign them? How old you, were you? I mean, I was 12 years old when I signed the contract. And how much <laughs> money did you receive for your work at Scientology? I mean, you're lucky to receive $50 a week at most. And so there's a clause in there that says, if you do not do this, 12-year-old, you owe us $100,000? Like You owe us full price, no discounted prices, full price for every Scientology, hour of Scientology auditing you've ever had or, a, or Scientology course that you've ever done. And, and your contract only start, the clock only starts ticking after you have finished your years of full-time training. So 
So wow. we signed the contract at 12. My contract, the, the time started ticking when I was 15. I was 15 years old when I finished my training and was sent back to Philadelphia. By the way, even when I went back to Philly, it was still without my mom. I was still going back to Philly as an unaccompanied minor living in someone else's house. Um, and did you, so- Did you sense that this contract had real validity? Like, were you like <laughs> worried that they would try to collect? Only in the world of Scientology. So okay. you owe them the money. And they'll never collect it through, you know, collections age, collections agencies. It'll never hit your credit report, but you have to pay the debt before you're allowed to do any more Scientology. Understand. Got it. And so that's the reason that during the two years that I was living out in LA with my brother, that we had no, no connection to Scientology, we weren't allowed to because we had this debt. And so basically what happened is that after two years, I just was sort of looking, you know, into the, the distant future. And just sort of came to terms with the fact that, remember, I still considered myself a Scientologist. So I was like, there's really no way around going back to Philly and finishing this contract so I can get rid of this debt that I'm never going to be able to pay. So I've got to go back and finish my contract. Now, it was a five-year contract. I'd only served like two years of the contract, you know, after my training had finished. So this is where my brother and I's path really departed. I went back to Philly to finish my contract. He stayed in L.A. Um, that's pretty much the last time I ever saw him. Wow. So you, you began to quote unquote, pay down this debt to Scientology at that point. By working off the remaining three years on my contract. And so, I, you know. And what one, was the conversation between you guys at that point? Was it, was it? It was just, I got to go back and do this. There's no way around it. And he was like, all right, you know, I'm, I'm not. Um, and so, you know, I went back to Philly, continued to go to the Scientology route. He stayed in LA and, and ended up just kept getting himself into some more and more trouble, some drugs, some alcohol, some, you know, some DUI incidents, some time in jail over that. Uh, and he was just in a bad situation. He was d struggling with some addiction issues that I never, I just had never got into all that. Um, so he ended up then going and moving in with my dad. Um, my dad at this point, him and his wife were in New Mexico. There's uh, Zuni, New Mexico. There's an Indian reservation there. And, uh, my stepmom was working as a doctor on the reservation. And so this is just where our paths diverged. So he went and lived with my dad. He started going to college. He started, you know, learning more about the real nature and history of Scientology, the stuff that I wouldn't learn about until much, much later. Um, he was going to school, going to college at UNM. He was planning on going to law school. Um, planning on becoming a lawyer, mostly to go after Scientology. This is stuff I didn't necessarily learn about until later. And um, he just tragically died in a car accident. That was not his fault. Um, uh, he wasn't driving. Um, everyone in the car, I'm sure, was drunk. Um, uh, but it was a tragic car accident, and, and he died in a, in, a, in a single car car accident um, late at night that almost certainly involved alcohol. So a, a, tragic, uh, a tragic ending. Mm. Um, and. Uh, yeah. So that's where our paths diverged was um, the point where I decided to go back to Philadelphia and he decided to stay in LA. And that was in uh, nine, that was in like the year 2000. Yeah. Oh, I am um, so sorry. The, that story is, uh, Ooh, I have a brother and it would, yeah you know, the Scientology perspective on everything that happened with my brother was essentially, that's what happens when you, that's what happens when you uh, get away from Scientology. You know, that's what happens when you're living, you don't have the technology of Scientology to handle your problems and your solutions. Um, now, what happened with my brother wasn't really an eye opener for either one of us. Um, by the time he, of time of the car accident, I had already joined the C organization and was working in Los Angeles. Um, my mom had already finished her training in, in Florida in Clearwater at flag. She was back in Philadelphia working for Scientology there. And, um, no, I'm embarrassed to say that when we went to his funeral and met all of his friends and coworkers and everything, we were just trying to tell him about Dianetics and Scientology. I mean, it's so cringy to look back on it. Um, and even my mom's speech at his funeral was more of like a, a finger wagging at everyone else for everything is not always okay, even if it looks that way. And even at the time I was thinking to myself, these are the ones who had to raise him because you ditched him. Like yeah. you, you shouldn't be wet, wagging anyone's, wagging any fingers at, at anyone here. You're the one who wasn't there mm. <laughs> during all this. You were doing Scientology. Um, 
And uh, yeah, we hadn't spoken to him for, I don't know, at least two years before the accident because he had eventually been declared a suppressive person by Scientology. Um, and, and even my mom and I were, um, what's the word? Cooperative, um, participated in getting him declared because we yeah. believed that what he was telling us he was doing were suppressive acts against Scientology. And we were true believing Scientologists. And he so was like he's, writing college papers on the nature of Scientology right. and his disapproval. On Scientology being a, a destructive cult that destroys families. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, even I personally, I remember, wrote a report, a, an internal Scientology report on this conversation that we had. And without question, that report would have been one of uh, one of the things that pushed it over the edge on, on him being declared a suppressive person. So this whole thing that happened with my brother was not an eye opener for us in our eventual path out of Scientology. So yeah. fast forward many more years. Um, well, gosh, just, just to, to pause you there, I, yeah. it's, I appreciate you saying that because it is such a, it's such a powerful statement about the nature of belief. And there are um, coercive ways that you can get people's hands dirty or at least make them feel involved to a degree. And I've, uh, when I've, I'm not saying that these are identical at all, but like when I've heard stories of sex trafficking, the debt that you incur, the fact that uh, you're involved in, like they find ways to make you feel involved in the outcome of your decision. Like all of these patterns I'm seeing play out in the things that you describe. And, you know, they'll end in abusive interaction with a hug and a kiss from your, from your pimp to you. Now, again, wildly different scenarios, but like these patterns that I think probably people who haven't experienced abuse can't understand uh, are really important for people to open their minds and hearts to because this is a predictable human behavior when you find yourself in such difficult circumstances where your entire life is structured around a particular set of beliefs and it's going badly is like to double down on that is so natural. I totally agree. I totally agree. In fact, I believe it's one of the reasons why people, um, so many people seem to be fascinated with kind of the Scientology stories that are out mm -hmm. there is because even if this person knows nothing about Scientology, there's so many aspects of the story that resonate with so many people uh, regarding other things they've experienced. Yeah. They're like, oh my God, it sounds just like this or it sounds just like that. Um, yeah, I used to think that Scientology was a real special kind of cult. And I read this book by Steve Hassan called Combating Cult Mind Control. And... Um, you know, Steve is now a, a specialist in, in, in the subject of, of cults and coercion. And, uh, and, but, but he himself in, in college was recruited in, into the Moonies. And he tells the story of how he got recruited, what it was like, how, how it all went wrong. And reading that book for me made me go, and it was devastating for me. I didn't even realize I was holding on to this special idea that Scientology was crazy, but it was a special kind of crazy. Yeah. When I read this book, I was like, Scientology is not even a special kind of bullshit. It's garden <sighs> variety bullshit and everyone who's in their own little special uh kind of bullshit thinks it's special <laughs> i feel that so deeply we don't need to do my stuff but man there's i have experience of of abuse and it's the same thing one of the things i held on to was like this is not like the other kinds yes. and and one of the hardest hitting realizations is how cliche the whole thing was and my reaction was cliche and it was just so, and all of the evidence I needed was right there in front of me in every 101 psychology book. And I read them all and I went, nah, -uh, not me. I'm different. And the fact that it was so obvious is what made it harder to accept <laughs> because it was too obvious. It had, I, I had, it, I needed a weird angle on my particular one. I, I very, very deeply relate to that, that yeah. uh, troubling realization. Yeah. Oof. So you stay involved for a short period of time after that. What was it that eventually caused a rupture with you in Scientology? So it was definitely in layers. So remember, uh, so in Scientology, there's three different layers of involvement or, or like levels of involvement. At the bottom level, you're a public Scientologist. You pay, you pay to do Scientology. Like mm -hmm. you pay, pay for auditing, you pay for courses. Then you're a staff member. That's when you're working for them, but that's on two and a half year contracts or a five year contract. 
Then there's the C organization. Those are the guys you hear about Scientology and the billion, the billion year contract. Those are the C org members. Okay. Mm -hmm. So remember when my brother died, I was a C org member working in Los Angeles. I was in the C org until 2006. He died in 2003. I was in the C org until 2006. My wife and I just got to the point in the Sea Org. My wife was also born and raised in Scientology. I met her in LA. We were both working in the Sea Org. We both got to the point where we were like, this is horrible. And again, not Scientology is horrible. Not we no longer believe in any of this. But being in the Sea Organization here, the day-to-day experience, doing what we're doing, where we're doing it, with the people we're doing it with, this is not something we can do for the rest of our lives. And we sort of had this unspoken agreement that we were just going to have a baby because you're not allowed to have kids in the C organization. If you get mm. pregnant, they pressure you to um, end the pregnancy or you have to leave the C organization. So, so getting pregnant is kind of your red carpet out of there because they only have a, so, they only have so much time they can keep you around. They don't want pregnant people walking around. Mm. So that's how my wife and I got out of the C org. But getting out of the Sea Org, we still had every intention of continuing to be Scientologists. See, that's Can I what I mean. ask you a quick, a quick question. Why, yeah. no, why no pregnant? Like, I'm reminded again of the priest class. It seems that Scientology and other religions recognize that the thing that takes you away is familial love. Like, that, that is the thing that can separate you from this. And it's, it's you know, I know your story. It's ultimately what happens. But do you have an idea from their perspective of why no pregnancy? Their perspective is uh, kids are simply a distraction to the business of Sea Org members. Sea Org there members you go. work 100, there you 120 go. hours a week, and like, we don't need kids. Kids wow. waste the organization's time and resources, and it, they don't make money for us. They only cost mm-hmm. us money. They only cost us money. So Scientologists, public Scientologists, can have as many kids as they want. Hell, even a staff member can have as many kids as they want. It's just not very feasible in Scientology because doing Scientology is expensive. It's not like a Christian family can have 20 kids and they're all, they all grow up to be good Christians. It's expensive to be a good Scientologist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and Scientology I guess I, families <laughs> tend to be very small. Yeah, and, and you know, Buddhists and monks and like they're – if. If you presume that you're devoted to a higher order, a higher power, I, I can see that, you know, we just don't, this is not for you. Other people get to have babies, but you are in service of the eternal or the, you know, something like that. Got it. That, that's a perfect way of putting it. The Sea yeah. members, they go, hey, they go, look, out of all the Scientologists in the world, there's only a handful of us Sea members. Let everyone else have the kids. We're the ones who've dedicated ourselves to doing this job. Let's not distract ourselves from that job by doing something anyone else can do. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we were like, uh, that was our way out of the Sea Org. Now that was 2006. We weren't officially out of Scientology until 2014. And the real path out of Scientology, as opposed to like just out of the Sea Org, the real path out of Scientology started in 2009. The Tampa Bay Times ran a series of articles called The Truth Rundown. It was like, it was a several part series. And the, uh, it was, it was uh, Tom, to- Joe Ch- Tom Tobin and Joe Childs um, were the journalists for the Tampa Bay Times. They were for the first time interviewing these former high-level Scientology executives who had been famous people in Scientology, who had worked closely with Miscavige for decades. And they were telling stories now how they had not only left the Sea Org, but these people had now left Scientology altogether. And they, they were revealing to everyone for the first time that as bad as Scientology might be for you at the local city level or the continental level, it's even worse at the international management level. The closer you get to David Miscavige, the worse it is. That was, that turned everything I thought I knew on, on, on upside down on its head. Because these people who were talking to the Tampa Bay Times, these were people I had grown up looking up to, admiring. These were the Scientology managers who were famous you guys were like on stage next to Tom Cruise yes. at some of the events. Yeah, these are the guys that five or six times a year, when David Miscavige would hold his international events, he would be introducing all these people to speak on stage. You know, so um, these are people. Uh, you know, you, you imagine like that. Hearing this information from these guys, it hits in a number of ways. Like, not only are these people who would know what they're talking about, but they're also people who threw away everything that a normal Scientologist would go, how could you throw, you threw away Scientology? Like it was so bad for you up there. You threw away Scientology. Like if you believe in what, what Scientologists believe Scientology is, nothing could ever justify throwing away Scientology because it's the only way to retain your eternal spiritual, um, you know, your native spiritual powers um, to, to get rid of the amnesia 
that you have every lifetime of your previous lives. Like no one beating you up every day could even justify throwing away Scientology. Mm -hmm. And you look at these guys who not only worked with David Miscavige for decades, but they worked with L. Ron Hubbard personally. And you're like, hmm, the math here is strange. On the one hand, you have Scientology. It's supposed to bring you uh, basically immortality. And on the other hand, you have what you experienced and you did the math and you threw Scientology in the trash. Something's not adding up here. Yeah. And so for me, uh, I, I was just naturally interested in knowing more. So I was like secretly in touch with all these people who were speaking out. Um, you whilst... seem to have a very rebellious streak throughout, <laughs> throughout everything that you've said here. I mean, I'm, I, it's, it seems like one of your saving virtues is that you are a rebel and an iconoclast. You, like, I never played hooky. I laughed about it, but I didn't I never, I did skip out on school ever. And you're, you know, ditching and yeah. scheming. And <laughs> I think that's... I, I, yeah. I get into a little too much trouble for my own good, but okay. um, it probably did serve me, um, serve me well in the whole yeah. Scientology experience and avoiding avoiding uh, uh, many of the pitfalls that that many other kids my age who grew up in Scientology didn't avoid. And um, so, oh yeah, so 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 uh, the Tampa Bay Times, the Truth Rundown stuff. Yeah, so I was secretly in touch with all these guys. I was also secretly commenting on the blogs that um, one or two of, you know, Marty Rathbun and Mike Rinder are two people who created blogs. Um, I was, so I was basically secretly commenting on Mike Rinder's blog and Marty Rathbun's blog and Tony Ortega's blog. And it turns out that Scientology had put a whole task force together to put profiles together of everyone who was commenting on these blogs under the different handles. And using, they would hack these websites and get the email addresses and the IP addresses. And using the email addresses and the IP addresses in the comments, they would create profiles of which Scientologists they thought were commenting anonymously on these blogs. And <laughs> And they, that's how they, that's how they busted me. They nailed you. They, I, I, I even had a private meeting with some people in the office of special affairs of, of Scientology. And they confronted me with not only the posts, but my email address. And I shit you not. Cause I just denied the whole thing. Deny, 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 deny. Yeah. And they said, well, we have the, your IP address that goes to the condo building that you live in, in Bel Air. <laughs> and I mean, they admitted to me that that's how they were tracking it. I still denied it. Just deny, <laughs> deny, deny, deny. I still denied it. And, um, and eventually they didn't really know what to do with me um, because I was, you know, I said, look, I, I, I just promised to be on my, good, my best behavior. You leave me alone. I'll leave you alone. And, uh, but I was still denying having been the one to make these comments. Eventually they said, look, we no longer think it was you. We know it was you. This is your last chance to, to come clean. And I was like, oh, is that the only reason you called me here today? And they're like, yep. I'm like, all right. Bye. And I stood up and walked out. And that's wow. the last time I ever saw any, any of them. Um, so it was essentially, you said that was, so 2009, those articles, that was the beginning of my path out of Scientology. Now, I think it was New Year's Eve, 2011, if I'm not mistaken. One of these former Scientology celebrity managers named Debbie Cook, who, as far as everyone knew, was still a Scientologist. She'd left the Sea Org, but she was still a Scientologist. She sent out an email on New Year's Eve to every Scientologist in the world, or damn close to it. And the email basically said, Scientology is great, L. Ron Hubbard is great, but David Miscavige is destroying everything. Mm. And stop supporting these programs that Miscavige is running and go back to supporting what LRH said we should all be doing. That was a big deal in the world of Scientology. Um, the, the, Debbie Cook, as a manager, was one of the most well-known, well-loved, and well-respected Scientology managers in the world. And for her to send that email out saying, I love Scientology, I love L. Ron Hubbard, David Miscavige is a piece of shit, that was a big deal. And it was a big deal to a lot of people who were still in Scientology. My mom essentially, and this is the nutshell version, essentially got declared a suppressive person and expelled from Scientology for spreading the Debbie Cook email information around to other Scientologists. She, she basically talked to, said the wrong things to the wrong people who turned her into the Scientology authorities. So she was uh, declared and expelled. I was basically told, you have to disconnect from your mom or you're going to be declared and expelled. And if you get declared and expelled, your wife's going to be declared and expelled. 
all this kind of stuff. So for two years, I just lied my ass off to the Scientology authorities that I disconnected from my mom. But you know, the way things work in Scientology is Scientologists are always spying on each other and reporting on each other and ratting each other out to the Scientology authorities. And again, the rebellious nature in me would sort of let it slip to some of my close friends to sort of test the waters that maybe I was still in touch with my mom. Um, I was kind of like- That's very interesting. So you were like, you're, you were yeah. almost planting information, like, you know, give it a try. That's thinking fascinating. It, uh, being totally ignorant to how it was going to, you know, uh, yeah. come back and hit me in the face. Um, so eventually, and, and, and uh, you know, my wife and I were both working at, the ta- at that time. We had a nanny who would look after our kids who herself was a Scientology staff member. Turns out she was actually spying on us through our kids because we never told our kids. Well, they were so young at that time. We, we never said, hey, don't tell anyone that you see your grandmother. We never said that. Right. So literally our Scientology nanny is asking our kids, Hey, when's the last time you saw your grandma and all this kind of stuff. And they don't know they're, they're not supposed to tell anybody. So like literally our own nanny who we're paying, right. We're her, we're her source or livelihood. She's ratting us out to the Scientology authority. Oh my gosh. That's what life in Scientology is like. That becomes normal. That shit becomes normal. That culture of snitching, again, there these these standard things that seem to exist in, in these abusive organizations, that's one of them. And it, I want you to continue. But one question is, do you agree with the assessment of that Debbie Cook email? Like, I, obviously, you're not like a Scientologist person now, but it seems like the things that are beneficial and helpful to Scientology may have been there prior to David Miscavige, and that some of the aggressive, suppressive person, cut this out of your life, change the rules up at the last minute stuff is his. Is, is that fair or you don't necessarily agree with that assessment? Well, the part that I disagree with is that, um, that Scientology would be great if everyone just did what L. Ron Hubbard said. Like I no longer believe in Scientology. I no longer believe mm-hmm. in full operating thing. So, but what I do, the part of the email though that I do agree with is that Miscavige, ha- like if you're a true believing Scientologist, Miscavige has- changed and altered a myriad of things that were core to Scientology when L. Ron Hubbard was around. Um, He's introduced programs that are completely contrary to Hubbard's policies. So, and he's managed to do this by convincing Scientologists it's what L. Ron Hubbard really wanted all along. Mm -hmm. So that's the only um, authority Miscavige really has is um, is, uh, 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 being supported by the authority of L. Ron Hubbard. Miscavige, in, in the whole like origin story or fairy tale of Scientology, it's not like he's some sort of a special prophet. Like any power that he has is just tied to the organization. Doing yeah. What L. Ron Hubbard wanted. And it's true that the the programs Debbie Cook called Miscavige out for in her letter, it is true that those things are not what L. Ron Hubbard said should be done. Whether anyone should give a shit about that is another conversation. Her, but, but the appeal that she was making to Scientologists was a legitimate appeal. Got it. That the ideal org program is totally off policy. The IAS fundraising statuses are totally off policy. We don't have to define all this stuff, but for the under the radar Scientologists, I just wanted to give some real examples. Yeah. Um, and so she was making a legitimate appeal if you believe in Scientology. Got it. Uh, yes. It was like Martin Luther, the 95 theses, <laughs> he started the Protestant Reformation. Interesting. Cool. Absol- absolutely. It was that. Okay. So go, <laughs> so go ahead and uh, continue with the, uh, so we have grandma is now, the kids have, have inadvertently snitched on, on you talking to grandma. That's right. So eventually they come to me and they're like, okay, this guy's just going to keep lying to us, isn't he? And they're like, yeah, it seems that way. And like, all right, let's stop messing with him. You're declared. So then they go to my wife and they say, well, you have to dis- divorce your husband and disconnect from him or you're going to be declared. And she's like, that doesn't even mathematically work out for me. It's, I'm not going to be able to do that. And they're like, okay, well, you're declared. And then they go to her parents and her sisters and her brother. And they say, well, you guys have to disconnect from Heather and the, your three, you know, their three kids, or you guys are going to be declared. And that's where, you know, at that point, her parents were both still alive. Um, you know, she has two sisters. She has a brother. They were all married to spouses who were Scientologists or whose family were Scientologists, all their friends are Scientologists. So eventually that's where the buck stopped is my wife's family all disconnected. I also have a younger brother locally who disconnected from me, but we we were never very close to be honest. Um, And so, you know, my wife's mom, her dad, her sisters, her brothers, her nieces, her nephews, they have not spoken to us since 2014. They all live within a 10 minute drive of us. Wild. Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many things here. Did you, 
emotionally, the w- the one that's coming up for me is anger. I, is that oh, something yeah. that you've had just? <sighs> it's funny. It's not anger. Like uh, at the time that it was happening, it's really a despair, anxiety. Mm-hmm. Like it's so, it's soul destroying, you yeah. know, seeing the cliff coming and, and trying to convince yourself there's something you could do to maybe avoid it, but there's really not. And you have to just sort of deal with it. Um, like it, it's just, it's absolutely soul crushing. And, um, uh, anger just isn't the word though. And, and, yeah. and even the anger that I feel, to be honest, isn't even towards Scientology. It's more towards Heather's parents for being so weak. Mm-hmm. Now I say that knowing they sort of had no, ch- had no choice in the matter. Like, like even if they had put their foot down, well, they would have lost two or three other kids. The other half of their family. Yeah. And so I don't, that's why I go, it's not hate. Um, it's a, it, there's a disgust. There's a disgust. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's not quite anger. And it's not even directed at Scientology. It's mm-hmm. directed at the individuals. Like Scientology only drives its power by the fact, fe- if everyone left together, yeah. Scientolo- if everyone just left together. <laughs> we do our own Scientology. We can make our own. <laughs> or, 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 or whatever. Um, or the fact that um, the sadness comes from the fact that any of these people have convinced themselves that Scientology is so valuable and having it taken away from you would be so uh, inconceivably destructive that you'd throw away your daughter, your granddaughters, and and not even seem to give a shit. Like, be totally okay with it. Totally okay with it. Yeah. Um, it's not quite anger, but it's something. I imagine that part of what makes it appear that way is like, okay, yes, it seems that the way that people form beliefs, whether they like it or not, is not by evaluating evidence, but asking, what do I stand to lose? And, and like I can, most people can just easily, unconsciously line their beliefs up with the thing that makes them lose less. And to acknowledge, I've lost all of these years, all of these people, all of this stuff. Like that is part of what, if I, if I step away from Scientology now, I have to embrace everything that I've lost up until now. And I think yeah. that, that that is probably, yeah, what part of it. I imagine that you had to review, review your brother at some point when you stepped away and think, you know, what have I lost in that period? Yeah, mm. totally. And I try not to talk about it too much because it's not fun yeah. to just cr- to cry on camera. But <laughs> Of course, of course. We don't need to uh, go... <laughs> We don't need to go too deep there, but um, yeah. Did you happen? I know you mentioned you saw my interview with um, Lex Friedman. Did you see it with Andy Stump by any chance? I didn't see Andy Stump. No, tell me about that. Okay, no, it was just a longer, a longer form conversation where um, no, totally unedited. The Lex, the Lex conversation was very, very edited. Anyway, I, I went on that. I went on that show, and I was like. I promised myself I wasn't going to cry on your podcast, Aww. Andy. <laughs> yeah. So we had a little bit of fun with it. But um, yeah, it's why on my own channel, I don't talk about myself or my story. I tend to focus on, you know, current Scientology events, other people's stories, that kind of stuff, because it's easier. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing what you have, not just for the humanity of it, which is, I, I mean, truly, it's... There are universal things and, and the nature of why it is when I look to myself and what I see is why it is hard to admit things about, you know, when it when it means that you would have to recontextualize a huge portion of your life and a huge amount of decisions. I I gain empathy, understanding for the people that you're describing for you, for your in-laws and for myself, which is, I think, powerful. Um, yeah. So slightly lighter, but still macabre. Can you tell the story about your dog and the neighbor? For the- <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So this is a story that was told at the <laughs> very end of my episode on season one of uh, Leah Remini's Scientology in the Aftermath. Um, yeah, we have a, a neighbor that lives behind us. Her name is Sue. She still lives behind us. And we used to just have a chain link fence separating our backyard and her backyard. And there was a gate in that fence. And we have... Uh, an amazing Labradoodle named Goliath. And he's just the greatest dog anyone's ever seen. And she loved that dog. And, uh, you know, and, and, and he loved going over to her house. Uh, she even had a doggy door put into her house just so our dog could go in and out of her house. And um, <laughs> whenever we would leave the house, instead of leaving him in our yard, we would put him over in Sue's yard. So anyway, um, she, when she got wind that I had been declared and the jury was still out on whether Heather was going to be declared, 
um, Sue was like, okay, well, just keep me updated. Because because Sue understood that if we were both declared, she was going to have to disconnect from us and our daughters. So when, um, when she finally, when he, uh, my wife finally told Sue that she'd been declared, Sue said, okay, all right, that's, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, let's talk about how to handle the disconnection with the girls. Um, but I really don't want to disconnect from the dog. Uh, he wouldn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> and so we were like, well, that's good for us because we still want to be able to put him in your yard when we leave the house. <laughs> so, so we wouldn't talk to her. We would just you know, let him in and out, but no, no conversation. That was her way. She's like, if we don't talk, it's okay. It doesn't count. Oh man. But then Leah Remini came over to shoot the episode of the show and word started to spread in the neighborhood that we had done this thing and Scientology. And I told that story yeah. about her and the dog. Scientology made her put up a wooden fence over that chain link. Fence. Oh my gosh. So that she couldn't see the dog. <laughs> oh, that's so sad. There's something so sad. I mean, obviously, the, the, the connection of the families, and it's like, I get that. That's built into the story that you've told about Scientology. But it's some, there's something, like, spiteful about the dog, which I just... To what end? Like who? Who yeah. gains? Like what do you? Are you protected from the dog's suppressive influence? I, oh, that that's it's totally insane. And you know, Scientology would if they were to comment on it, which they wouldn't, but they would say it's not the dog that was the problem. It's that the dog was a connection to us. Yes, yes. That she that is any, in some any, way. Oh. Yes, that she's in some way aiding and abetting us by giving our dog love and companionship when we weren't there. That would be considered a connection to suppressive persons. So and, I, uh, am I now connected to a suppressive person via this conversation? Oh, definitely. Yes. yes. So I can't, places an, that I can't on, go. I'm not invited to the celebrity center or to the flag center after this conversation. No CC gala invitation for you. Understood. <laughs> um, this, this insularity that you're describing, which seems to have ramped up perhaps over the last, I don't know if it has or not, maybe LRH had it the same way. Um, you've described, in your opinion, it's, it's, it's not helping Scientology grow its numbers. It's, it's hurting it. And so a couple of yeah. things, like if I think back to, I don't know, maybe it was 10, maybe it was 20 years ago, like Tom Cruise was talking about Scientology and was out there evangelizing for it. And John Travolta, you know, was comfortable at some degree being known as a Scientologist. Um, you made the point in a recent video, I haven't heard a celebrity mention Scientology in years. And yeah. is it because of the Going Clear documentary and some of these stories that have gotten out where it's just like associating with it is not good? I really do. Well, I think that they would say it's not that they're embarrassed to talk about it. It's that they realize that the evil psych-controlled, pharma-controlled media – Mm -hmm. is going to twist anything they say uh, into the worst way possible and that the best thing to do is to just tell people to buy and read a book. Like they, they would probably say, it's not that we're embarrassed. It's that we're not going to give the media fodder to attack Scientology by virtue of us mentioning it. Like if we mention it, we open the door, then they're going to talk about Leah Remini. They're going to talk about Alex Gibney. They're going to talk about Mike Rinder. They're going to talk about Xenu. So th they're probably looking at it as the best strategy, even for Scientology, mm -hmm. to stop talking about it so much. It's a little counterintuitive, right? Because it does seem yeah. like it does seem like they're in retreat. But you might go, well, why Tom's? Why did Tom stop talking about Scientology? I think he convinced himself that. It was causing Scientology more harm. It was mm -hmm. it was creating a new vector of attack. By from big pharma and big psych. This is how Scientologists think. That um, it, it was great while it lasted. You know, it at least got the word out there. No press is bad press. And then, but it does seem like someone along the line was like, well, maybe not all press is good press. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe <laughs> some press is bad press. Yeah. Maybe we should stop talking about it. But it's true. The Jenna Elf, you know, Jenna Elfman, Giovanni Rabisi, Juliette Lewis, John Travolta, Tom Cruise. When's the last time any of them publicly promoted Scientology? Mm. I haven't heard it. 
Is that um, a thing that you think they arrived at individually with just surveying the landscape? Or do you think that that was like a directive? Because I know that Scientology is, is involved with their celebrities and, and used to like talk about outreach and that sort of stuff. Or is that like yeah. a directive that they received? You also mentioned, I didn't know this, that Grant Cardone was a Scientologist and oh, was yeah. asked about it in a, on a podcast and sort of... Um, oh, yeah. To me, it was not suspicious. But to you, he was like, oh, he's he's not telling the whole truth about his involvement here. Because to me, he was just like, ah, you know, I'm kind of into it. We took a couple courses, got value, don't really go for some of the other stuff. Um, yeah, and I'm curious um, if the, if, so there's a bunch of questions in there. You can take, <laughs> take them in any order. So the, the first part of the question, it definitely would have been a directive. Um, all the celebrities are, are dealt with personally by the president's office at the celebrity center. And just because you're a Scientology celebrity doesn't mean you have authorization from Scientology to, t- to talk about it in the press. Only certain people are allowed to talk about it. They get drilled over, they get drilled and drilled on exactly what to say, how to answer questions, especially since these days, so many of the questions have to do with David Miscavige imprisoning people and beating people and all this kind of stuff. Back in the day, Scientology celebrities weren't asked about that kind of stuff. So Scientology doesn't want celebrities even answering questions about that kind of stuff. A directive would have come down uh, dictating what people were allowed to say and not allowed to say. Even how, you know, Grant Cardone, when someone starts to ask him a question about Scientology, uh, he doesn't let them finish the question. You'll notice he cuts them off and he gives his answer to whatever he chooses was asked. That's how he would be drilled to handle those things. Grant Cardone Mm -hmm. is one of the biggest funders and recruiters for Scientology. Uh, that's the only reason I even talk about him on my channel. I don't really care about his real estate scams. <laughs> that's just fun. Uh, he's one of science. He's given over $30 million to Scientology. Uh, at this point, he's probably one of their biggest recruiters because mm-hmm. Grant Cardone's whole business tend, uh, seems to be, um, seems to hinge on reaching out to a young male audience who go, I want to be more like you. I want to be flashy like you. Well, Grant goes, well, the other way you can be like me is to join Scientology. Sure. He does get a lot of young people into Scientology, whether yeah. they- I don't know how sticky those recruits are. Um, But yeah, so your first question was, would all these celebrities have, you know, would there be a directive or would they have come to this conclusion on their own? There would have been a directive. Interesting. Um, And Grant Cardone, I do, I do wonder how much of what Grant Cardone does and says uh, about Scientology is really appreciated by Scientology. Um, But it's definitely, I don't go for that belief stuff. I I got value out of the courses and I'm a practical guy because that's sort of what he says to, which to me matches his, at least his online persona is like, look, I'm here, I'm here for practical. What works for me, not for big picture answers about the universe. Yeah. I mean, how Grant responds to um, the stuff he responds to is pretty good from a Scientology perspective. It's just that Grant himself is so problematic. I'm sure Scientology would rather he just stop talking about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, got it. That's got my it. opinion. So, gosh, okay. So we've got our celebrities. We'll get to the Danny Masterson thing, which is coming up. I want to see if there's anything on this. Yeah, Scientology and retreat. You have mentioned, which I, when I watched the Going Clear, I was astounded by the size of Scientology. It was like billions of dollars tax. You know, now now they're tax exempt. They've got these major stars. So let's do first question one. Is it just a random sample size that they wound up with the Tom Cruise and Leah Remini, or is there something about Scientology and the way that it marketed itself that seemed to hit you know, some of the most hyper successful people? I think it's because Scientology is a, such an ego driven activity. The core message of Scientology is you are a god, mm-hmm. and not like you are God. <laughs> so I don't know. Is there something? about that particular message and approach to life that could be appealing to Hollywood types. Mm-hmm. Perhaps, perhaps. I think there's something about that that appeals potentially to a lot of people, whether you're a Hollywood yeah. type or not. Um, Scientology specifically goes after celebrities so that they can, it's almost like a marketing gimmick. They want you to think that Scientology is the secret to success for some of the world's most successful people. Um, Don't think about it too deeply because you could go, but wait, there's more successful people who have nothing to do with Scientology. And there's, Mm -hmm. there's super Scientologists who are failures in almost anything in life. Like, don't think about it too deeply. It's just, it's just skin deep marketing that Scientology wants to use celebrities. I, I, I think because they've been trying so hard to get celebrities in the place where most of the celebrities are, it's just a numbers game. They're going to get some, I don't know that Scientology is uniquely interesting to famous people. 
Got it. I, I just don't really think so. And real Leah Remini was born. It was practically. I think she was born, born into born, it. Yeah, almost born into it. Juliette Lewis is born and raised in Scientology. Giovanni Ribisi is born and raised in Scientology. Beck was born and raised in Scientology. You know, Skrillex, all these guys. Like, I didn't um, know. I, you're just dropping names that I don't know. Is there anybody else? That I'm, like, because it's surprising to me to, to Michael Pe- Michael Pena. Um, okay, Ethan Suple. Um, I'm gonna forget. And uh, we don't need to out everybody if they're you know. Well, I, I, none of these people are secret Scientologists. It's just that it. um, a lot of people don't know. It's not a secret. Got it. Um, they, they, they don't, they don't lie about it. Mm-hmm. Like they're just not usually asked about it. Um, <clears throat> Do you it's think been it's a possible? long time since Scientology like recruited yeah. a big celebrity. The last one was Will, was Will Smith. Do you think he, he's a Scientologist? Cause I, I Googled this and he seems to deny it. Well, he's not a Scientologist anymore. Okay. Okay. But him and Jada were, and they even recruited other celebrities into Scientology. So I guess what I'm saying is, um, Scientology almost doesn't really deserve the reputation that it has for being the religion of celebrities, the mm-hmm. Hollywood religion. They have actually a relatively very few famous members um, and, and they're losing them faster than they're gaining them. Like other than Will Smith, who, who's the last, the, a lot of the celebrities I've mentioned, they just happened to be born into Scientology in Hollywood families. The Mastersons, Danny Masterson, Chris Masterson, Jordan, and Alana all born and raised in Scientology in a science, in an entertainment industry family. Got it. So it's just, um, it's just the law, law of large numbers. They were bound to get some. And I think probably like if you put two people and one is told like you're God, the world is at your fingertips, you have superpowers and somebody's told you're limited, you know, like which of them is likely to make a bigger impact in the world regardless of the metaphysical truth of either of those statements, you know, somebody who believes in their limitless potential is likely to do it and then see that as confirmation of the metaphysical truth of the thing that was told to them. So I think that there's a possibility there as well. Yeah. Um, And I don't want to mischaracterize other religious beliefs, but just, you know, my religious knowledge comes mostly from pop culture, but in (laughs) Christianity at the risk of misrepresenting it, if you have the idea of like, let Jesus take the wheel, you know, you come to terms with the fact that you are not in control. Let, let God, you know, dictate everything. Scientology is the complete opposite of that. The complete opposite of that. You are literally the cause of anything and everything, even the bad things that happen to you. You are the cause of that at some level. Mm -hmm. And the only chance that you have of succeeding is to realize how you are the cause of everything so that you can then move forward and be the cause of everything. Yeah. And um, yeah, I don't know. I'm curious whether other people would, would think that would be uniquely attractive to Hollywood types or not. I'm, I'm just it's, not really It's sure. very self-helpy. Like the, 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 again, there's nuances that I think can turn it from, you know, uh, potentially something that is harmful to something that is truly beneficial. But um, to see oneself as responsible or everything that happens to you, whether or not you caused it, is like a core tenet of Tony Robbins and, and the most famous self-help people. Um, and then some might even go so far as to say, if they're more spiritual, that like you create your entire experience via your perception and learning to manage that is the key to living a happy and successful life is to realize you are literally the cause of everything, but not in the way that like you made the car drive, but you, you, you superimpose meaning onto that. Um, so it's yeah. not... It's not out there in the nowhere land, and it does seem to be correlated with greater success in life. And, of course, the people who don't succeed are now out there giving glowing testimonials for Scientology <laughs> in the same way. So there's survivorship bias. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things that are going on. That's right. Um, That's right. So moving to the Danny Masterson trial, we, why was Scientology so involved? Why was this not, this guy is accused of a thing, good luck, <laughs> you, know, you know, like, Okay, there's there's a few reasons, and I'll and I'll step back if you can, because Danny Masterson played Hyde on that '70s show, and if you can, just give a little bit of background about what he's accused right. of and, and convicted of at this point. That's right. So Danny Masterson, the actor, that '70s show, he was also on The Ranch with Ashton mm-hmm. Kutcher for a little yep. while on Netflix, but everyone knows him from that '70s show. Um, he is he he was tried for three counts of forcible, um, uh, uh, the three women he was charged with drugging and. F-ing. Uh, were all Scientologists at the time that he drugged them and them. 
there are in fact well over 10 women who have come forward and said that they have been drugged and or by Danny Masterson. There are people um, in the United States, in Canada, in California, in New York, uh, in Florida, like this was clearly a long-term thing that Danny was doing. Um, out of all the women who came forward, he was charged with three of them. He was convicted um, for two of them. Uh, he, was not, he was not acquitted on the third one. The jury just wasn't unanimous. So that was a, a mistrial on that charge. He's now facing minimum of 30 years um, in prison with uh, 30 years to life in prison. He's going to be sentenced on August 4th. Mm -hmm. So the main reason Scientology was introduced into this case was to explain why the women had not come forward to the police sooner. Mm -hmm. It was necessary. And, and that wouldn't even have actually come up if the defense hadn't tried to use the fact that so much time had transpired if the defense hadn't tried to use that fact to discredit the victims. Understood. They were supposed to, the, the, the defense team had told the judge that they were planning on just making an argument about consent. They weren't actually trying to challenge whether this stuff occurred at all. And they were trying to use the fact that the women had taken so long to come forward to imply that these events never even occurred. And the judge said, if you're gonna try to impeach their credibility with that argument, then I'm going to let the evidence be introduced about why Scientology was the reason these women didn't come forward. And you opened the door to that in the first trial. So that's why the first trial, that Scientology evidence wasn't admitted. The second trial, all that Scientology evidence was introduced for the first time because uh, the defense had opened the door. And it was, was Danny Masterson or what did the organization of Scientology quote unquote protect him, provide legal counsel, lawyers, that sort of stuff? Or was that, or were they hands off? So to the best of my knowledge, the church did not pay for his attorneys or provide the attorneys to the best Got of it. my knowledge. But Scientology, like it is against Scientology's rules to ever report a Scientologist to the authorities for any reason whatsoever. It doesn't matter if your own child was abused mm. by a Scientologist. You're not allowed to involve the police. There's another thing in Scientology where, um, uh, well, we already spoke about it. Everything is essentially, you are the cause of essentially everything that happens to you. So there's not this culture in Scientology of coming forward and you know, making false complaints about somebody doing something to you. Cause all you're really doing is making yourself look like an idiot because Scientology is just going to come back to you and go, well, what did you do to cause this? Mm -hmm. Like there's no social capital. There's no, there's nothing to be gained in Scientology by coming forward and making up things about some horrible stuff that was done to you because Scientology is going to investigate you as much as they investigate the person you're accusing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what happened with Jane Doe one is she actually came forward to the Scientology authorities and, and, and the Scientology authorities thoroughly investigated everything and determined that Danny really did do what Jane Doe was accusing him of. So what Scientology oversaw was a civil settlement and non-disclosure agreement. Under Scientology's direction, now I think Danny hired his own attorney. I think he paid for his own attorney. Um, Thomas, yeah. Me Thomas Mesero was the attorney um, at that time representing Danny. Under Scientology's direction, though, there was a $400,000 settlement and non-disclosure agreement between Danny and Jane Doe One. That does not happen unless Scientology goes, you did this. We're now going to have to protect ourselves from what you've done by locking Jane Doe One up in this thing. You're going to do this. You're going to do this so that we're legally protected. Like That could have only occurred under the direction of Scientology because Scientologists don't sue each other. So Scientology had to green light the fact that, yes, this occurred. Yes, Danny's liable. We're going to try and seal this up by getting a settlement and a non-disclosure agreement. Both Danny Masterson and Jane Doe One continue to be Scientologists for many years after that. But I'm, I'm explaining all this because when you said, did Scientology protect him? What Scientology does is protect themselves. Now, in order to protect themselves, they would have made sure that Danny's victims were not going to go to the authorities. So do you see what I mean? Their yeah. interest, Scientology doesn't give a damn about Danny Masterson. They give a damn about themselves. And in the process of protecting themselves, they end up protecting Danny Masterson as well. I'm sure they wish Danny Masterson would just drop dead and save everyone a big headache. God, they, have so, no, they have no love for him whatsoever. So from an organizational psychology, if they had, like, why is, would it be bad for a Scientologist to say that in a uh, non-civil, in a criminal case, this happened to me and just go ahead, deal with it. Like, do they think that that reflects badly on them if they have criminal anyone inside? It 
commits a criminal act that is known about? Well, not really, because Scientology is not shy about accusing its own members of crimes. Yeah. They just don't want it dragged into the court system. They don't want any, any written documentation making its way. Scientology hates, looks down on, disdain, has disdain for the uh, criminal justice system. Uh, sci- they think Scientology justice is the only real justice, that only Scientology can fix the reason why people commit crimes or behave badly anyway. That makes that, sense. That, okay. that submitting a sign, uh, like, yeah, so if you were to uh, file a You're criminal You're hurting complaint, both people by, by submitting yourself before this judge and this, this higher authority, you yes. are hurting both parties because this is not an authority that ought to be weighing any, I, I, okay. It's yes. the Scientology has the authority to yes. mediate disputes. Got it. That's right. And so not only do they, um, do they not, not, not only would they say, well, putting that Scientologist in prison would just prevent him from receiving Scientology, which is the only thing that can really help him anyway. Mm-hmm. They also just don't want Scientology dragged into criminal proceedings. They don't want the word Scientology appearing in a court transcript. Yeah. They don't want to talk about fair game. They don't want to talk about witness tampering, witness intimidation. Like, um, that's all very bad news for Scientology. Yeah. Yeah. If, and, and that is consistent if you believe that, like, look, we have the one true understanding, and this is just a state government that is going to rise and fall, and we're trillions of years old, and we had, like, we'll deal with this. Don't worry. Right. We don't need to worry about that <laughs> kind of small, small stuff. Interesting. It seems like the thing, and, and I've heard you say this, but I think it's the thing that makes it go from, look, there's a lot of religions that have a lot of beliefs that people outside of that religion are going to look at and go, that's crazy. And I think it's almost a disservice that the most mainstream understanding of Scientology is that South Park episode where people, <laughs> where people laugh at the volcano and Xenu, and it's like, I could po- point anywhere. And to somebody who's not inside of that religion, if you take it literally and not as some sort of mythological understanding, yeah, you're going to find that you think it's goofy. But what's really unfortunate is that what I've learned from you is that the real tragedy of Scientology is not that people believe in Thetans or Xenu or go earlier, similar, you know, or, or have this thing. It's that one, it's deeply coercive, it sounds like, to children. And like that, that's horrible. And the way that they deal with dissent is ruthless like cancer i mean it's 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 anti free speech anti um it's it's almost insecure in its approach to the truth like look if you've got the gospel if you've got it and it's true in time you don't need to finagle and trick people and make people choose between their family members the truth wins in the long run and this insecurity of like we can't be confronted with dissenting beliefs and people who spread lies it does belie a deeper level of insecurity. It's true. It really does. Um, and it's funny. I've um, for a long time I had the idea that the internet was the destruction of Scientology. That the fact that their crazy beliefs are now you know there, just a Google search away, mm-hmm. must 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 be what has destroyed Scientology and and caused it to shrink. But I'll tell you, the more I hear stories from former Jehovah's Witnesses, former Mormons, those are the, the stories I hear most often. <clears throat> and the more I understand, I, I have come to the conclusion, Scientology's crazy beliefs and the fact that they're only a Google search away has nothing to do with why Scientology has failed because there's crazier shit out there. Scientology has destroyed itself by just treating its members so horribly and abusively that even true believers eventually feel like they have no choice but to leave. It's not, it's not even the Xenu stuff. That's, yeah. it's, that's not what's causing Scientology problems. It's how abusive and destructive they are to their own members. And again, I think you mentioned, um, what was the word you said? Did, did you say it belies an insecurity? Yeah. It, it, I, it's, I really like you putting it that way because it's like the, the, the way they treat people so horribly does belie kind of an insecurity that they have to treat them that way to make, the, to make them stay. Because if everyone, if everyone was just able to make up their own minds. You're trillions of years old, relax. They would leave, right. <laughs> you know? Well, and again, you're trillions of years old. You're going to reincarnate. You win, game over. You've got the truth, relax. Let them win this lawsuit or step away from Scientology in this lifetime. The truth is gonna win over trillions of years. And because because you're all gods <laughs> you know, don't yeah. don't sweat like why why abuse the legal system or make a website with your name and then put a bunch of aspersions <laughs> against you it just seems so unnecessary when you've got literally you are god or a god <laughs> um so yeah i think it it's it 
is tattling, uh, not tattling on itself because it's not, it's the people inside of it are tattling on their insecurities yeah. about it. They're definitely all sowing the seeds of their own destruction. Mm -hmm. And so I want to pause there because when I watched Going Clear, I was like, holy crap, this thing's a behemoth. And in your videos, you're like, this is shrinking. So just tell me briefly about that. Oh, I mean, there's less than 25,000 Scientologists in the world. There's probably less 25. than- 25. Yeah, it was 35 in the video that I saw. Have you adjusted your numbers? Or are you- Well, oh, no. So, it was, uh, so the 35 figure that I use in my video, that mm -hmm. is a figure intended to be so generous- Mm -hmm. that, um, and also it depends on how you want to define what really is a Scientologist and sure. active Scientologist. Scientology has its own definitions. So in my video, I stand by my generous estimates that if Scientology announced today, L. Ron Hubbard has returned and we are holding an event at Dallas, uh, the Cowboys Stadium, AT&T Field, whatever it is. And what does it hold? 100,000 people in that stadium. Mm -hmm. If they announced this weekend, we're having a mandatory event. Um, David Miscavige will be introducing the new L. Ron Hubbard, and we will be announcing the release of OT 9 and 10, what Scientologists have been waiting for for like 45 years. You could, you might, might be able to scrounge up 35,000 people in the entire world to show up for that event. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean there's 35,000 Scientologists. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's why I say on a day-to-day -day basis, there's, there's probably less than 25,000 Scientologists. But, but that even with the most generous estimates, in the entire world, there's not more than 35. Mm -hmm. That is so much smaller than anyone really thinks Scientology. Even Scientologists would laugh at you if they heard that number because they are told that there's millions, 5 million, 10 million, 15 million Scientologists. And there's just something about the, the thought control that exists in these high control groups that technically speaking, every Scientologist right in front of their own eyes, there's enough evidence to prove that there's not more than 35,000 Scientologists, but they don't think about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They don't, you're, you just don't think about stuff like that. You don't want to think you're being lied to. It, it, nobody, nobody wants to be in a cult. No, nobody who's in a cult even thinks they're in a cult. No Scientologist thinks they're in a cult. Yeah. Wow. And so, and it, so you also think, commensurate with the numbers, that the power and influence Scientology has is going, like we're seeing less celebrity activity. We're seeing probably lower recruitment, maybe less money being funneled into Scientology. Is that generally in line with what you're thinking yeah. is occurring? Absolutely. The only thing that's not going down is their actual cash on hand. Okay. Because, they're, they're, because they are tax exempt, um, their overhead, you know, they uh, Everything they yeah. own, they own outright. They don't have any loans. They don't have any debt. They don't pay any taxes. They have um, the, their, 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 their employee expense is potentially zero. They don't even have to pay their staff. Their staff are volunteers. There are, there's no one in Scientology that actually pulls a salary, like except for David Miscavige. <laughs> but um, where am I going with that? Oh, yeah. The, even though they're making less and less money and they have less and less new recruits and less and less members, they're not actually losing money. They're just accumulating money more slowly. Yeah. And until their tax exempt status gets revoked, I don't expect their, um, their cash, their assets, their reserves to actually go down mm. because it just doesn't cost anything to keep that, that ship running. Um, uh, electric, their electric bill, their electric bill and their water bill is really all it takes to keep a Scientology organization open. And Scientology, I'm, I'm guessing makes enough money, makes enough interest on their uh, billions of reserves to pay those utility bills. Even if, even when they're almost completely out of members, they can still yeah. keep the doors open on the facilities that they have. Sure, sure. So you they're know. they're doing fine financially. Understood. They're they're doing okay financially. Um, I do believe they will lose their tax exempt status, though. I do. Okay. Yeah. Some, some big predictions. We'll revisit these in the future. <laughs> um, so let's wind down with this. You, what are you doing today? With I mean, so you're you're uploading. Are you full time involved with the Aftermath Foundation, or do you have a separate thing that you're doing as well? Well, the Aftermath Foundation is run by the board members, and all the board members are involved in the operations of the foundation. And and the foundation is always helping people who are escaping from Scientology, but it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't um, take up all of my time. Okay. I have a real estate business. I have the YouTube channel. Um, one of uh, one of the reasons, one of my uh, motivations to continue to upload is just every video is an opportunity to let Scientologists know that if they need help escaping from Scientology, they need help um, reintegrating into the real world. Um, you know, uh, any, anyone who's experiencing uh, a disconnection and Scientology's fair game policies, the Aftermath Foundation is there 
to help. So it, it wouldn't be honest. It wouldn't be accurate for me to say uh, working with the foundation is my full-time job mm -hmm. or takes up all of my time because it doesn't. Um, by the way, none of the people who work for the foundation um, take any pay or salary. So mm -hmm. that, that's not even a thing. Um, no. Uh, how, how is the foundation doing? I mean, are, is, it, is it being effective in its, its aim to it's one, reach out to people? It's been unbelievably effective. There was, mm -hmm. there was, a, there was a major doubt in the beginning uh, how, whether Scientologists and staff members and Sea Org members would learn about the foundation, know that those resources were available. And you know, because Scientology is so small and because everyone is connected by uh, only one degree of separation and ev every Scientologist, whether they know it or not, is connected to someone else who's secretly out of Scientology and knows about the foundation. Uh, word has spread deep into the Sea Organization, and we've been able to help Sea Org members um, plan escapes from every echelon of Scientology organizations. Wow. It's been incredibly um, effective. So, I mean, none of, none of these things I've just mentioned, not any single one of them is my full-time job. Not, not the real estate, not the YouTube, not the Aftermath Foundation. I, I, it, it, I spend time working on all of those things. Um, but it is one of the things that drives me, is being able to uh, continue to raise awareness within the Scientology bubble of the Aftermath Foundation. And that uh, even someone who's been in the Sea for 40 years has no money, has no relatives, has no passport, has no place to go. Uh, we can even help that person get their life restarted. That's so beautiful. That's got to be so rewarding. Yeah. And there's going to be a documentary coming out soon in the next uh, maybe six weeks that's going to tell one of the most incredible stories um, uh, that uh, of someone the foundation has been able to help. So, uh, so much more to come. It, it's just every day is a bad day to be David Miscavige. <laughs> oh, <laughs> every day is a great day not to be in a cult. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, uh, so appreciate your, uh, I mean, how, how else would you be having gone through what you've gone through and arrived where you've arrived? Like your, your positive attitude and your boisterousness and your, uh, ability to laugh and see the lightness in in all of it is um commendable and i think a testament to your spirit so well, that's you. awesome and i'm sure i hope that you have the space and time and it sounds like the people around you now where you can revisit the pain as well which we absolutely do not need to do oprah winfrey style here on this <laughs> podcast <laughs> thank you <laughs> um but where can people find you uh, growing up in Scientology on YouTube, I'm on, on Twitter. You can find me there, um, Facebook, but mostly YouTube. YouTube's what I spend uh, most of my attention as far as the social media world. YouTube's where it all revolves around right now. Cool. And we'll keep an eye out for that, uh, that new documentary, right? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks.